Now I believe we've reached the frightening point in the program where the MC is supposed to introduce the speaker. I see too that the speaker's comments are titled Reflections, which sounds like a polite way of saying comments from a very old person before he gets completely senile. <laughs> now, as I understand it, it is my job to speak and it is your job to listen. And my one great hope for this afternoon is that I will finish before you do. <laughs> one day in 1962, a man named Russell Reed walked into Harold Schaefer's office in Bismarck and started talking about Medora. He talked about Theodore Roosevelt. I have to think he probably talked about the Marquis de Maurice. We know for sure that he talked about some of the historic buildings in town the Ferris store, and particularly the Rough Riders Hotel. Russell Reed said that if something wasn't done with those buildings almost immediately, they would be lost, and so would the history that's associated with them. He was there in Harold's office because the Historical Society had no money to buy these buildings, and he wanted Harold to buy the Rough Riders Hotel. So as Ed has just told us, Harold, true to form and being a great TR fan, went out and bought the hotel. He bought the hotel from a woman named Nita Organ. And according to local Medora legend, Nita's late husband, Ivan Organ, had won the hotel in a poker game a few years before that. <laughs> Harold then went to Russell Reed's office, handed him the deed to the hotel, and said, here, I bought the hotel, and I'm giving it to you. When the legislature convened again in January of 1963, Russell Reed was there, asking for money to restore the historic old building. The legislators listened, more or less politely, I guess, and said, you have got to be kidding. The 1963 legislature was not putting one dime into Medora. Now, in fairness to the legislature, you have to remember that in 1963, the Rough Riders Hotel was a shack. Actually, the truth is that the original Rough Rider, and that's what we're talking about, was not much more than a shack on the best day it ever had. <laughs> It was built by a man named George Fitzgerald, and it was originally called the Metropolitan Hotel. Construction started on November 27, 1884, and on, by mid-February of 1885, the doors were open for business. On January 19th of 1885, A.T. Packard, the editor, well actually he was the entire staff of the Badlands Cowboy newspaper, reported that Quote, Fitz says the Metropolitan is just booming. So imagine this, in the dead of a North Dakota winter, they laid the foundations in the middle of January, and they opened the doors two and a half months later. A two-story, 35 by 80 foot building, built, furnished, and open for business in two and a half months. Somebody cut some corners, I think. <laughs> you should all read the story of Ami Clement the young woman in Chicago who traveled to the Black Hills in the spring of 1885. And I know a good book where you can read that story. <laughs> Ami Clement took the Northern Pacific from Chicago to Medora, and here she spent a night at the Metropolitan before taking the Marquis's new stage line to the Black Hills. Ms. Clement found the conditions of the Metropolitan so bad that she slept on top of the bed and covered herself with her own coat. This is when the hotel was brand new. <laughs> In about 1960, when I was about 10 years old, I spent a night at the old Rough Rider with my parents and my brother. It was about 75 years after Ami Clement was there. I remember the bathrooms at the end of the halls. I remember the names above the doors of all the rooms, like Wild Bill Hickok, Calamity Jane, Theodore Roosevelt. It was all very exciting stuff to a 10-year-old boy. The names, not the bathrooms. <laughs> I can tell you, that the intervening 75 years had not been kind. Like I said, the hotel was not much more than a shack in 19, 1885, and by 1963, when the legislature was asked to intervene, it was literally falling apart. You have to remember, too, that Medora had dirt streets. There was no water system. There was no sewer system. There were real hitching posts in front of some of the stores, not tourist contraptions. The entrance to Theodore Roosevelt National Park was several miles to the east, and I-94 did not exist. Russell Reed handed the deed back to Harold and said, it's yours. It was his. Well, we all know what happened next. Harold jumped in with both feet. He started buying and building and restoring. In my opinion, the legislature refusal to rebuild the Rough Riders Hotel was the first great moment in the resurrection of our town. 
If the legislature had accepted the deed, then Harold probably would have gone on to other things. He had his gold seal company, his Blackburn Ranch, his family, and even in the 60s, some political aspirations. He had plenty of things to keep him occupied. So, well, in any event, Harold poured his money into his, and his soul into Medora, often to the great dismay of the people at Gold Seal, who were charged with the responsibility to grow the company and keep it profitable. Medora was not profitable. Harold paved the streets, he installed curbs and gutter throughout the whole town, he installed a water and sewer system for the entire town, he bought more and more property, he bought up the remnants to Old Four Eyes, he bought the amphitheater, and in 1965 started the Medora Musical. As Ed says, he took the Rough Rider apart, board by board, labeled the parts and pieces, put it all back together again with some 1960s innovations like bathrooms and insulation. <laughs> He did the same thing with the fair store, he built gift shops, he built a zoo, he started a real shooting gallery where he could pay a couple of bucks to shoot one of Theodore Roosevelt's rifles into the butte over here. What was he thinking, you know? I suppose if he'd have gotten a hold of one of George Washington, George Washington's acts, we all could have paid three dollars to be a couple of wax at the old cottonwood tree by the post office. <laughs> Fortunately, the rifles are saved before they were lost, and they're, on, they're now on. Those rifles are now on display in the interpretive center at the park. Harold built the Badlands Motel and Rancherama and dormitories. He built two log homes, and he amassed a truly wonderful collection of artifacts. And he built the Museum of the Badlands to house them. He bought the historic von Hoffman House and established the Doll Museum. Bought the old town hall in 1918, 1984. And uh, in about, in, I think that was in uh, 1980, 1983, in 1984, put up the Bunkhouse Motel, which may not be the source of greatest pride on this list, <laughs> but if you total up the number of guests and employees who stayed there over the last 33 years, I think you're going to have to, so have to ask yourself, what in the world would we have done without it? You know, it certainly filled a big void. Now this is an aside, but I got to tell you my favorite story about the bunkhouse. It involves a lawyer from Dickinson named Paul Kloster. He and his wife came to the door one day a few years ago, and for some reason they ended up at the bunkhouse. Well, Paul woke up very early in the morning, and he couldn't get back to sleep. So he's laying there tossing and turning, tossing and turning, and finally he turned to his wife and he said, What time is it? And the woman in the next room said, It's a quarter to six. <laughs> that the Medora assets had to be separated out. But what then? You know, that idea raised a lot of questions of its own. Was Harold going to soldier on alone in Medora? Well, without the gold seal company behind him to provide financial support, that, that wasn't going to happen. Should the Medora assets be sold off piecemeal? I suppose that would have raised a little money. But it also would have meant that it was the end of Harold's hopes and dreams for Medora. Those would have disintegrated. And so in the end, this foundation was created. And that was a new beginning, and in 1986, almost exactly 100 years after the town went bust in 1887. 31 years later, I think we can say that creating this foundation was the best thing that Harold Schaefer ever did. I think creating this foundation was the single best thing Harold ever did. Of course, it wwasn't just Harold. Uh, in 1986, there were actually 22 stockholders in the Gold Seal Company. All of them donated their share of the assets to the new, the new foundation. They were Harold, Shyla, uh, Harold's longtime secretary and the family's longtime friend, Irma Walters, and seven of Harold and Shyla's children, and the 12 grandchildren who were then living. And several of them are here today. Once the decision had been made to establish a foundation, it needed a name. That was the first order of business. Initially, Harold wanted to call it the Medora Foundation. But then somebody said, what about Theodore Roosevelt? Well, Harold was on it like a flash. He was uh, a big TR fan, and the man did have his impulsive moments. So he seized on the suggestion in an instant and immediately declared, okay, we'll call it the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation. 
And as Ed later reported, it was a done deal, the end of all debate, one minute of entirely one-sided discussion, and that long, unwieldy name was ours forever. <laughs> when the foundation was formed, Harold was worried. He wondered if this thing was going to work. For one thing, there would be a board of directors. That was a little scary. He wouldn't be able to call the shots. And Harold wasn't so sure he liked that. But the bigger issue was that no one knew if this thing, this foundation, was going to be accepted. The creation of the foundation and the transfer of the Medora assets to that foundation was essentially a gift to the people of North Dakota. But that didn't mean that anybody was going to embrace it or that they would even care. But it soon became apparent that this idea was going to work. At the very first meeting of that new board of directors, Governor George Sinner walked into the meeting room and he said, this is so important for North Dakota, I want to help. That was a pretty big deal. It was a big moment. Sinner was a Democrat. Harold, a very prominent Republican. And then, when the foundation took on its first major project, which was the rebuilding of the amphitheater, the first really big donation came from the Melrose Company. There in Fargo, the east. And of course, Medora is all about the west. So, it was working. Virtually from the start, Medora and the foundation transcended politics and geography all of North Dakota embraced it, wanted to be part of it, and has wanted it to succeed. I have one or two close friends who never really drank the Medora Kool-Aid, and I try to respect them despite this black hole in their collective soul. <laughs> but for those of us gathered here today, this is a very special place. It's a magical place. I know that when I come driving in from Bismarck, and I never tire of the trip because I love western North Dakota, but I gotta say that driving past the 40-foot fiberglass cow is not exactly the same thing as dropping over the rim, then looking back over your shoulder into the west end of the Painted Canyon. It's magical. Emily says the heavens open and the angels sing. It gives me a feeling of peace. Every time I drive in, I feel like I'm coming home. Now that Emily and I have bought a house here, we can literally say we're coming home, but that's not really what I'm talking about. That's fun. But this feeling isn't about owning a house, it's about a feeling of being in a very special place. I know that many of you, most of you share that feeling. TR felt it, Harold and Shiloh overflowed with it. Some of the speakers last night talked about it. It's hard to describe. Nonetheless, it's very real and it's very powerful. One reason that feeling is so hard to describe is because Medora has so many different things to so many different people. For me, it's about the Badlands themselves and the history that permeates every foot of this place. TR's cabin, the Marquis' house, the ruins of the meatpacking plant, the Elkhorn, the Maltese Cross, the Von Hoffman House, Fair Store, and the Old Church. I love them all. We have six museums in this tiny town, and it fascinates me. But for many people, Medora is all about going to the Medora musical. They went with their parents when they were kids. They sat there, stared at the stage, and dreamed about being Burning Hill singers. They went when they were in high school, when they were young adults. They went with their own children, and now they're taking their grandchildren to the musical. And their family traditions live on, and those traditions are profoundly important. Medora is deeply, North Dakota is deeply invested in this musical on an emotional level. So to, the Kurt, to Kurt and the cast, I say, we take a lot of pride in this musical. We care about it. We want it to be good. We want to be able to tell our out-of-state friends, come to Medora and make sure you see the musical. For those of you who haven't seen it yet, I, I'll tell you that as Ed said, I think this year's edition is one of the best ever. Every year, Shiloh would say to me, Rolf, the show is the best it's ever been, and the Badlands have never been greener. Every year, like clockwork, as sure as the sun comes up in the east, she would tell me the same thing. And this year, she'd be half right. <laughs> I'm afraid the hills are burning up, which is very sad. For others, the biggest draw in Medora is the new Gospel Brunch. It's big and getting bigger, and you all need to go and see it. For some, Medora is all about playing golf on a really great golf course. For some, it's about music. They come to play it, they come to sing it, most come just to listen. Or they come to go to a show like the 4M Review. For some people, the best thing in town is the performances by our wonderful team, of Roosevelt reenactors. They make our history come alive, and I think we're extremely fortunate in this regard. For some, it's all about the park and the Badlands and the Little Missouri River, seeing the buffalo and the horses and the elk, prairie dogs, too. And if you're very lucky, even bighorn sheep. 
There are people who are out in the park every single day, day after day after day. They know every fact there is to know about every horse out there. It's their reason for being here. They wouldn't be anywhere else. It's their passion, and for them, it's what Medora is all about. Brothers, it's about bird watching, photography, observing wildlife, canoeing, hiking through the Badlands, riding a mountain bike down the Matahe Trail, or riding a horse in the hoof prints of George Custer's sitting bull, Gaul, the Marquis, and Theodore Roosevelt. For some, it's about riding a Harley from Bismarck or Fargo, and their destination is Boots. And others only want to sit in the Little Mo and soak up the old West atmosphere. For some, the real draw is a spectacular meal at Theodore's, or a special event like the Fourth of July fireworks, car show, a horse show, or a rodeo. There's so much more. But whatever it is that draws us here, we all come together in this very special place. Look around this room. We have volunteers. We have donors. We have major donors, we have employees, performers, board members, producers, administrators, and rank and file members of the organization, of the foundation. Each of us is drawn here for our own reasons, but together we become a family of people who embrace Medora and love Medora, and each one of us finds our own passion here, whatever that might be. But we wouldn't be sitting here celebrating our love for Medora for this special place if Harold not, had not believed when no one else believed. If Harold had not poured his money and his soul into this place and if he and his family had not formed this foundation. My real point in all of this is that this foundation is a wonderful thing. Because the foundation was formed, we're all a part of Medora in a very, very real sense. There are people here who have given million dollar donations to help Medora. Yesterday we honored the two families who gave the largest donations to remodel and rebuild the old town hall. Thousands of people give donations, ranging from the cost of a membership on up. And each number, great numbers of people apply for five or six hundred positions as volunteers. None of this could happen without our foundation. If this is still a family operation and doesn't make any difference which family you're talking about, there would be no volunteers, no donors, large or small, no one would be buying memberships, and this would be a very, very different place. Since this foundation was formed in 1986, the Burning Hills Amphitheater was transformed from rough wooden benches to the state-of-the-art facility. The Rough Rider was remodeled and rebuilt into today's spectacular version of the hotel. The Life Skills Center was built, and that has changed Medora profoundly. The fantastic Bully Pulpit Golf Course was built. The Jaden Terrace was built. Elaine's Garden, the Sculpture Garden just east of the Schaefer Center was built. The Children's Playground was built. The Von Hoffman House was remodeled and restored. Several homes were remodeled and restored. The Old Town Hall was remodeled into a beautiful new facility. Uh, and the beautiful new Badland Saloon and Pizza Parlor has been built thanks largely to the generosity of Bob and Jane Anger. The parking lot and the road to the amphitheater have been rebuilt, another multi-million dollar project. The gospel brunch has been established and expanded and a new venue created out of the old. A new compound has been established for cast housing. A new shop built to help facilitate the production of the musical. The Spirit of Work Center has been built to house our army of volunteers, largely through the generosity of Greg Butler and the Badlands Motel has been remodeled and upgraded. It's a pretty remarkable list, folks, and almost none of it could have happened without this foundation. Through the foundation, we are a family of people who are passionate about Medora, each for our own reasons and each with our own traditions, but through the foundation, we are building something important together, something we can all be very proud of. I'll tell you one more thing. Medora is also important because it is a real significant place in the history of the United States. There are a number of reasons for that, but I'll talk about just one. This place changed Theodore Roosevelt, and by changing him, this place changed history. North Dakotans are very far in pointing out that on one or two occasions, T.R. said that if it had not been for his experiences in the Badlands, he never would have been President of the United States. Now, maybe he only meant, Joe Wiegand and I have talked about this, many times. Maybe he only meant that this was an important chapter in his life and he profited from it and without it he would have been a lesser man. But I prefer to think that he meant this, that if he had not been a rancher in these badlands and not lived, had not lived and worked among the cowboys, then he never would have raised the Rough Riders. This idea of forming 
a cowboy army, if we can call it that, didn't just suddenly coalesce in PR's mind in 1898. In 1886, when he was living out here and working on his ranches, there were serious rumors flying around the West about an impending war with Mexico. At that time, PR was searching for something meaningful, and he probably meant dramatic, to do with his life. He wrote to the Secretary of War, William Endicott, and suggested that he, PR, should raise a cowboy army out here in the Badlands and then ride against Mexico to avenge this terrible insult that had been visited upon his United States of America. He also went to the territorial governor in, in uh, Bismarck to promote his plan. Unfortunately for TR, but very much to the benefit of everybody else, the little dust-up with Mexico was settled diplomatically and TR's plans came to naught. But I think we can say that had TR not been out here on his ranches living amongst the cowboys, he would not have raised the Rough Riders. And if he had not been the historic leader of the Rough Riders, then he would not have been elected governor of New York. I think that is quite certain. If he had been not been governor, then the politicians would not have made him vice president, and had he not been vice president, then he would not have become president. Well, we can never know for sure, but it's logical. And so, when TR said that if he had not been president, but for his experiences here, he was probably right. I really prefer to look at the statement that he made to his friend Albert Fall, a guy who later became a U.S. Senator from New Mexico. He told Albert Fall, that if he could retain just one memory from his lifetime to the exclusion of all the others, he would choose to remember his time on the ranches in North Dakota. Quite a statement from a guy who led the Rough Riders, served as governor, vice president, and president. Clearly, Roosevelt's time out here was very important to him. But we ask ourselves, why does it matter? Does it really make any difference? It matters for a number of reasons. This is where TR, Theodore Roosevelt, the privileged East Coast aristocrat, learned to get along with regular folks. Rough people, in many cases. The cowboys on these ranches didn't give a lick that he graduated from Harvard, or that he was in the New York Assembly, or that his name was Roosevelt. If anything, he learned those could be negatives. The cowboys did care if he held up his end on a long, cold night of riding the big circle on the roundup. They cared if his word was good, and they cared if he backed down from a worthy, worthy fight. When he came out here, he was a dude by any definition but he learned how to get along with regular folks, and eventually they, and millions more like him, became the constituents that propelled him into the White House. Even more significant, this is the place where TR made many of the observations that became the basis for his ideas and his policies on conservation. Here on his own ranches and on the surrounding rangeland, he saw the results of overgrazing and too much hunting. He saw that in no time at all, the buffalo, the elk, the bears, and most of the deer and antelope were wiped out. Of course, his policies were also, we can't take all the credit, by any means, this man traveled extensively, and I suppose every muddy stream he ever crossed in his extensive travels influenced him. But the destruction of the northern rangeland between 1880, in 1886 and 1887 made a huge impression on Roosevelt. These prairies had supported untold millions of buffalo for eons, and then, with the un introduction of uncontrolled ranching, the range was almost completely destroyed in about five years. It was unbelie almost unbelievable how quickly it happened. It was a tragedy of epic proportions. Pierre took the lessons he learned here in Medora and went on to become the most important conservation president in our history. His impact on our country can hardly be overstated. This is an important place. It shaped PR. It changed his policies and his politics, and so it changed the course of U.S. history in a very good way. Folks, this has all been a very long way of saying that as members of the Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation, we all belong to something very good. We belong to something important, and we belong to something worthy of the very best that each of us can give. Thank you. Final thought. Sometime when you're out in the Badlands, maybe just a little bit after sunset, on an evening when the sky is choked with clouds, 
Then, just at the moment when another day has slipped away, I invite you to stare into the darkening sky and squint your eyes and listen. And then, if you try real hard, maybe you'll hear something like this. And then faintly at first, you hear the beat of the horse's hooves. They get louder and then they become a thunder. And you squint again, harder this time, and then you see them coming, plowing through the ragged sky. First comes Harold riding his favorite horse, Pretty Buck, out of the Blackburn stream. There are better riders, but he has the best horse in the bunch and he's in the lead. Half a length behind is the Marquis de Maurice. <clears throat> Tall, elegant, and graceful, a graduate of the French Cavalry School at Sumar. He rides like he was born to the saddle, easily the best rider of them all. And then here comes T.R., all teeth and spectacles and grim determination, but reveling in the excitement. He's riding Manitou and spurring hard, trying to keep up as he passes you here fully. Behind him rides Sitting Bull, thundering along on a brown and white paint. Solemn and dignified, he rides with a single rein and a scrap of a blanket. And then Gaul, the Lakota war chief, fierce, tall, and frightening, the most imposing man in the bunch. Gaul rides bareback. And then here comes George Custer on his favorite horse, Dandy, dressed in buckskins, his yellow hair flying in the breeze. Just off Custer's shoulder and stuck there like the shadow of death, rides a Lakota warrior named Rain in the Face. Rain is on a big gray gelding, riding a McClellan saddle taken from a fallen horse soldier. And there are others in the haze. The Marquesa, diminutive but supremely talented. She's one of the best riders in the pack, and she's making a move on the leaders. A.T. Packard, the newspaper man from the University of Michigan. Captain Tom Custer with his two Congressional Mem Medals of Honor. The Ferris brothers, Joe and Sylvain. Sylvain, riding like the wind, and Joe, the storekeeper, clinging to the saddle horn for dear life. Bill Merrifield, arrogant but expert, a crack shot and a fearless rider. Fred Willard, our gun-toting, gun-fighting first sheriff, and hell-roaring Bill Jones. And Bob Roberts, the no-account proprietor of Big Mouth Bob's Bug Juice Dispensary, riding a stolen horse. E.G. Paddock, charged with numerous crimes, including murder, but always acquitted. He's our man of no convictions. And then Margaret Roberts, who raised five little girls all alone, on a tiny, dried-up excuse for a ranch about six miles south of here, right inside saddle. And then, as suddenly as they came, they're gone. But never really gone, for they are the ghost riders in our sky. Thank you.